Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first Facebook Live as a part of our Focus on Your Health segment. I'm Teresa Snow, and we thank you so much for joining us. I'm joined by Dr. Mark Hunter of the Ellis Fischel Cancer Center. It's a part of MU Healthcare. Welcome. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks so much for joining us. This is in partnership with KRCG-TV. Our Focus on Your Health segment can be seen every week on KRCG, 6 o'clock Wednesday nights, 6 a.m. and noon on Thursdays, and it helps us uh, prompt into these great discussions about uh, different topics of interest to viewers and to our patients as well. Well, Dr. Hunter, you're the director of the Women's Cancer Center of Women's Cancer Care at Ellis Michelle Cancer Center. And tell me a little bit about yourself. What types of cancers uh, do you treat? Tell me about your patients. Well, thank you again, Teresa, for giving us the time to discuss these important topics. So I specialize in the treatment of women's cancer. So that includes a women's uh, cancer of the reproductive female tract, and that really includes vulvar, vaginal, cervical, uterine, and ovarian cancer. Are there any that you see more of uh, in your patient population? I tell you, in mid, uh, where I trained in, in, in L.A., a uh, great deal more ovarian cancer. But since coming here a decade ago, I see uh, quite a bit of uterine cancer. In fact, the majority of our patients are uterine. We still see all those other cancers here, uh, but a, a good number uh, of cancers of the uterus. So we welcome Dr. Hunter to our community talk here for our Focus on Your Health segment because you've had a real passion in cancer care and nutrition. You've given community talks around the area and you speak to your patients every day about good nutrition and cancer care. Why the passion for this particular topic? Well, Teresa, really my passion is in preventing cancers. I want to put myself out of business by uh, passing this information on to as many people as we possibly can. I, every day I spend uh, holding the hands of people who are genuinely suffering uh, and, and overcoming cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that process, anything that I can do to prevent cancer uh, and prevent uh, one more patient from coming into our office with a surprising diagnosis, I, I would like to do that. Uh, when it comes to cancers of the female reproductive tract, they're all preventable in some way. And we could go through those five cancers that I mentioned and describe how each one has a pathway to prevention. It doesn't mean that all cancers are preventable, uh, but so many of them that we see are. So we're focusing on nutrition. Let's start with that preventing cancer with nutrition mm -hmm. uh, angle. What can we do as someone without cancer uh, as far as nutritionally to help put us in the best position to prevent cancer? Well, I think that we can really look at the prevention of cancer with nutrition uh, in two schools. So really there is the notion that there are specific foods that I increase the risk of cancer. And so when you look at uh, issues like uh, high fat foods, so when you think about high uh, fats that are, uh, or foods that are high in animal fat, so we want to make a distinction between animal fat and uh, really uh, high quality plant-based fats because they are very different from each other. So when you go to a fast food outlet and you uh, order uh, food, what you're really getting is a, a, an awful lot of animal fat uh, and we call that the Western diet. So a Western diet is very high in carbohydrates, very high in animal fat and clearly associated with an increased risk of, risk of cancer. But we hear about good fats, so That's what are right. those? So when you look at the good fats, they are high in omega-3s, they are uh, high in, in, in actual uh, constituents of those fats that significantly decrease the risk of cancer. They don't just decrease the risk of cancer though, uh, they, they seem to be associated with a regression for people who have existing cancer. Uh, not just that, but they um, uh, slow the aging process. Uh, they, we all want to do that. They, we do. <laughs> they decrease, obviously, heart disease uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, lots of, uh, of physical benefits. Uh, you asked what those fats are, so, or at least what those foods are. And the answer uh, that I usually give to patients is that the avocados and olives and nuts and seeds, and it seems to be uh, that those foods are, are, are specifically associated with these health benefits we're, we're talking about today. So at the grocery store, my list should have those items. It should have all, yeah, absolutely. Uh, any plant-based fat, so you can, you can read these natural, uh, and really, well, we're talking about fresh foods, and so as you, star uh, as you start to uh, look at processed foods, the more processed a food is, the, uh, the, the less health benefits associated with it. We did a story with KRCG that uh, prompted this specific Facebook Live talking about blueberries and the extracts of fruits and mm -hmm. vegetables and their properties to potentially uh, accelerate cancer treatments. 
you're seeing good nutrition sometimes as a working in collaboration with treatment. That's right. So what we're seeing really in the studies that we've been investigating, and, and you mentioned four years ago, uh, I had a, a, a real shift in, in my thinking on this. And so back then it was about eat what you want, life is short, enjoy it, live it up. I personally love hot fudge brownie sundaes, and I don't want to live a life without hot fudge brownie sundaes. So I'm not telling people you've got to eat this way uh, or, you know, or, or else. It's more a, lot, a matter of balance. And so uh, four years ago, though, we started pouring into the literature and asking the question, does nutrition actually matter when it comes to cancer care, not just for prevention, but for treatment or for patients who are fighting cancer at the moment? And it's clear that the medical literature has a good body of work that, that, that does demonstrate just that that there are certain specific patterns of eating that uh, not only prevent cancer, but they actually uh, work in conjunction with the very latest cancer treatment technologies. Here at Ellis Fischel, we use uh, everything at our disposal, the very, very latest technology. And that includes um, robotic surgery. So mm -hmm. I will diagnose mm -hmm. a patient with cancer. I will bring them in. We'll do a complex, uh, minimally invasive robotic staging operation. And then the, the reason I picked GYN Oncology is because it, that allows me to then to switch hats and in the clinic become their medical oncologist where we're prescribing chemotherapy, we're prescribing hormone therapy, the very latest biologic therapies, and doing research that leads to the next to newest therapy. And it was very clear from some of that research uh, that specific patterns will enhance the treatment uh, that we're offering them through the very latest science. It's interesting you mentioned the robotic treatment and the high-tech science, but the team at Ellis Fischel is also everything from the nutritionist to the social worker to uh, maybe an offer of a yoga class or a massage. There's all these other things that are part of that lifestyle um, treatment. Oh, absolutely. It is really fascinating how much data there is now. Uh, we uh, have a clearinghouse called PubMed.gov, uh, and re really uh, that is the place where anyone with a computer can go and read their own studies. If you put meditation into PubMed.gov, uh, you'll find 4,000 articles in the medical literature on the health benefits of meditation. The true is all, that is also true of yoga, uh, and that's where we get a lot of this information on, on, on cancer. You mentioned the blueberry study. There is a, a good amount of data that, uh, like those types of studies, in patients, in animal models, and in, uh, in what we call the, the bench research that, that you mentioned, uh, where these uh, foods enhance cancer treatment and de decrease the rates of recurrence. Let's talk about those common advice that you give patients. You told me earlier that it used to be you'd tell patients, eat whatever you want. You have cancer. It's a very difficult time mm -hmm. uh, to get through. Now you're telling them something different. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still a matter of not feeling guilty. Uh, I, I went through a phase where all of this information was so overwhelming for me, I just wanted to passionately tell everyone about it. And I feel like that passion was also leading people to feel, you know, maybe this cancer is my fault. And, and that is not at all the case. Really, cancer is such a multi-factorial uh, process that it involves so many variables that nutrition really is just one of a great deal of variables. Uh, I do want patients to know that they can make a difference. It, and, and really this concept of treating cancer with nutrition empowers patients. It gives them something to do. Mm -hmm. It gives them their families something to do. Instead of uh, families now, you, you know, when they used to say, you're not eating enough. You just you have to eat more. You have to eat more. Uh, what we're really trying to say is actually that's not necessarily true. It's not um, getting your family member to eat more, but getting them to eat well, eat the right things. And uh, in doing so, they're in, they actually are enhancing the cancer treatment, both the quality of life for their loved ones with cancer and the quantity of life. So if you have a loved one with cancer or you have cancer, uh, some people will enter that, that, that journey overweight, some will mm -hmm. enter it underweight. How would they face it differently? You mentioned having good nutrition, but there's specific challenges if you're overweight. Would you want to tackle that at the same time or underweight? They, they really, they re, those are definitely different. And, and uh, the, I mentioned that I, I primarily, well, I, that we have a lot of uterine cancer here mm -hmm. in, in mid-Missouri. And, and one of the reasons is uh, the amount of energy storage that people choose to keep on them. 
Um, I don't like to use terms like obesity because I think that labels increase the, the really the guilt and shame associated with a particular lifestyle. People choose how to self-medicate. People choose what to use to make themselves feel good. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's food, sometimes it's shopping, sometimes it's smoking, sometimes it's exercise, sometimes it's reading. Yeah. Some of those from a health perspective are more, uh, let's just are say productive. Yes. Uh, but it's yes. still a personal yes. choice. Yes. Uh, but I will make the specific point that an, um, a large amount of energy storage uh, is associated with an increased risk of, can risk of cancer across the board. When you take uterine cancer, for instance, a um, patient with a large amount of energy storage uh, has a 620% increased risk for wow. uterine cancer. So when I say it's preventable, that's one of the ways that it's preventable. If you decide, if you choose to have your self-medication, to, to live a life where you don't uh, use food as much as a form of self-medication, and therefore you decrease the amount of energy storage you carry around with you every day, you will greatly reduce mm -hmm. your risk of 22 cancers, not just uterine, but 22 others, uh, including u ovarian and cervical cancer in my practice. Directly related to how you eat and uh, what, very, what you very, choose. Very, very much so. What you choose. So if you're in a treatment for cancer and you uh, have a lot of energy storage, mm -hmm. is that the time to think about making that change? You're oh, saying absolutely. yes because it can help your treatment and help your life beyond Yes, th there, is, there is clear evidence that uh, reducing the cal calorie intake, your overall daily calorie intake, uh, not uh, only prevents cancer, but enhances the treatment of cancer. Now, that is a, uh, a, a thought that is taking some time to evolve. It, it has been in antiquity that we've taught patients, when you're undergoing cancer treatment, it's not the time to lose weight. Um, and that may be true when you're actively undergoing radiation treatment, but even the data in that area is uh, uh, less than uh, convincing. And so really what we're finding is that dec if you have uh, energy storage, a significant mm -hmm, amount mm -hmm. of it, that if you fast or if you reduce your calorie intake, uh, you will likely enhance the treatment effects. Uh, on top of that, uh, you again, you slow the aging process, you decrease inflammation, uh, and uh, the list goes on. So clearly, quality of life is improved with a reduction in energy storage. What if you are a cancer patient, you're underweight, you're given a lot of fruits and vegetables, people are probably going to want to see you eat a big burger, mm -hmm. want to put pounds on you right. at that time. Oh, absolutely. And and I get that. I understood, you know, again, that is um, people who love th their their mother, their their daughter, their, their, their brother or sister, and they want to do, they want to feel mm -hmm. empowered to do something for them. And really the answer is not in those foods that we mentioned. A recent article actually came out last week, and we're always scanning the literature for mm -hmm. this so we can deliver it to our patients. A recent article came out that showed the more you eat out, the more you're exposed to toxins in those foods. And so uh, driving through a fast food place and getting a, a lot of fast food and trying to uh, convince your, your family mm -hmm. member that they need to eat that to uh, survive this cancer is really quite the opposite uh, of, of what the, the literature shows. Is there a specific label we might put on that good diet? Is it uh, ketogenic? Is it paleo? Is it Mediterranean? Mm -hmm. what, what type of diet is it? Uh, that is a great question, and you know this is. Uh, they all have their their pluses and minuses. Okay. To be honest with you, it is quite clear that the Mediterranean diet is probably one of the the best and well studied in the medical literature, and there is good evidence to show again med the Mediterranean diet, lots of olives and lots of olive oil, and olive oil even as a, a dietary supplement uh, decreases the risk of cancer. Uh, when you look at things like uh, paleo and ketogenic. I, I will suggest that we do recommend a diet high in unsaturated plant-based fats, which looks a little like ketogenic. But ketogenic doesn't necessarily specify animal versus plant, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Ketogenic is also very strict about dipping your urine for ketones and making mm -hmm. sure that your body is in a, a, a somewhat for, uh, form of starvation called ketosis. I'm not crazy about people <laughs> obsessing over those urine dipsticks. Or the dip word sticks. starvation. Or the word starvation. And um, so uh, all of these have their benefits. Uh, I, I try to embrace the concept of evaluating the literature 
it is a constantly evolving thing. And the minute I say it's Mediterranean or it's ketogenic or it's this or it's that or it's you know any one of these other brands, is the minute I sort of give in to the notion that it is uh, that this dogma is the right way. Mm -hmm. When really what we want to do is watch the evolving science that continues to change that bar uh, day by day as great studies come out, like this blueberry one that you mentioned. Yeah, getting better every day. It gets we get smarter every day as a species, and part of that is uh, is adapting to the changes in the literature. Where maybe uh, you know a, a diet that we thought was really valuable uh, is not so much anymore. My mom gets really frustrated, and she calls me, and she says. Uh, I, uh, you know, one day this is good and one day it's not good anymore and then the next day it's good again and, you know, how do you know what to trust? And my answer is, you know, you know science continues to move That's forward. True. Even if our opinions about things uh, maybe sometime wa sometimes wax and wanes, uh, still we do move that bar forward little by little, year by year. Yeah. I'm just going to stop and make sure we tell everyone we are live um, for our Focus on Your Health segment in collaboration with CARE CGTV. This is Dr. Mark Hunter of the Ellis Fischel Cancer Center. He is the uh, director of the Women's Cancer Care at Ellis Fischel, and we welcome your questions as well. We're having a conversation about cancer and nutrition, and so you can go on um, the comments section and leave us a question as well. Um, you talked a little bit about the fruits, vegetables, nuts. Um, what about preservatives, add additives, pesticides, um, things we worry about when we talk about fruits and vegetables? Well, those are real concerns. Uh, fruits and vegetables uh, it, it quite clearly have a nutritional benefit. Uh, you, obviously, blueberries is a topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all, all fruits are, are valuable. I will tell you that um, when it comes to fruit, I will have patients, again, who may have a significant amount of energy storage who have locked on to the concept of fruits and feel very, very proud that their, their diet is now entirely fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, when you look at what they're eating, it's a lot of fruit with a lot of sugar. sugar. And yeah. so uh, what we have, are finding is that the most beneficial products um, in fruits are the peel, and especially the dark pigments in dark pigmented fruit. Uh, so when you look at a blackberry, blackberry has a ton of small, uh, uh, balls covered mm -hmm. in surface area and those surface area that's where the best nutrition is so it has a very high peel ratio to the sugar content inside well look, to compare that to a cantaloupe what do we do with a cantaloupe we eat the sugar inside mm -hmm. and we throw away the peel what do we do with a banana we eat the Bye. sugar inside we, we throw, throw away the peel, the peel. Uh, and so really, uh, we, I try to convince patients that it's the blackberries and the blueberries and the strawberries and the raspberries, very high peel, very little sugar inside. A medium strawberry has uh, five calories, five calories in a mm. medium strawberry. Uh, it's almost free. Just don't dip it in the chocolate like yeah. I like Well, to do. I like the chocolate too, and I'll tell you that dark chocolate has a lot of health benefits well, to it. Well, that's good so, to know. Uh, it's, it's worth exploring. And then on the vegetable side, of course, um, most people uh, really feel that the, they're doing wonderful when they're eating vegetables, and it, but those vegetables are fruits. Okay. So. I'm going to switch the questions just mm -hmm. because we have one from one of our viewers. Uh, Jennifer is asking, can we talk a little bit about good fats and bad fats and why it matters? We touched on this at the beginning of the conversation, but let's do go back to that. Uh, good fats, bad fats. Um, give me a description if I'm uh, eating out or mm -hmm. going to the grocery store. Oh, what's good, what's bad, and, and why do I care? Yeah, so um, really what we're finding is that most animal fats are not good fats. And, and why is that? Well, may, may be the saturated fat content, but we think there's probably more to it than that, even things that we don't necessarily understand. Um, I will make one exception to that. Uh, probably one of the better animal fats is cheese. So we went into this, uh, in, into this research thinking, you know, cheese is the enemy. Cheese has really been demonized for most of my life, uh, you know, half a century. And really when we started looking into the data, what we found is that aged cheese is actually quite good for you. There's there calcium in there. Great calcium, uh, but really this concept of fermentation seems mm. to make a lot of things good for you, a lot of things healthy for you. And when we look at sauerkraut, very mm -hmm. healthy. Really almost anything fermented has some health benefits to it and aged or, or good quality cheese does as well. So that's an animal fat that's maybe a good fat. Um, when it's highly processed, 
and you get it in the packages and you get it in the slices, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's less good for you. Is that because it has higher sodium or just really a higher fat content of that animal fat? You know, uh, you mean why, why uh, the processed cheese is mm -hmm. not as good? Well, we don't exactly know. It definitely loses a lot of its nutritional value and probably a lot of its antioxidants. And so that's not, that is a word that gets thrown around a lot and we don't fully understand it. But the process of fermentation and the bacteria that create these, these dry cheeses, they, um, they produce good things for us. In the bowel, we have those bacteria as well. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't talked much about the microbiome. And I do want to finish up on the, her, the question, uh, what about good fats? And I'll uh, just uh, touch on that for a minute and then go back to the microbiome. Okay. Uh, we don't know why plant-based fats are, are so good for us. All we know is that in animal models, if we, if we separate uh, uh, animals with cancer into uh, a Western diet, or a diet that is high in unsaturated plant-based fats, they, the animals clearly do better and their cancers shrink with these, uh, these plant-based fats. Again, it probably has something to do with omega-3s, but that is not at all the, the mm. whole picture. When it comes to the microbiome, no, this is a, define that. I've not yeah. heard that term. Microbiome. Microbiome. It, it means the the whole entirety of all the bacteria in your body. So okay. we're actually made up of cells, and those cells, uh, fascinatingly, we have about thirty trillion. And these numbers are rough, uh, roughly thirty trillion mammalian cells. Uh, it, it, and that means that cells that you were born with. Mm -hmm. So that you, one cell became two and two became... Because we're mammals. Because we're mammals. So you have mammalian cells in your body, about 30 trillion of them. Uh, uh, but you are actually walking around in about 100 trillion cells. So where does the other 70 trillion come from? The answer is bacteria. Hmm. So you carry around these 70 trillion bacteria. What does that mean for us? They control everything. There's data now to show that if you eat a lot of starchy foods or you eat a lot of carbohydrates, those carbohydrates breed bacteria that love carbohydrates in the gut. What do those bacteria do? Well, think about it. They only eat, back, they only eat carbohydrates. So if you overbreed a population of carbohydrate-loving bacteria in your gut, they will start to change your behavior. We now have data that show that they will send signals to your brain to tell you, eat more carbs. That's what we eat. We eat carbs. Please send us more carbs and you will start to get hungry for more carbohydrates, which is why in my own life, if I decide to slip a little and I have a, a burrito or some, you know, a sandwich, uh, within three hours, I'm looking for a cookie or I'm looking for a bag of chips. It's true. That's part of it. It's These bacteria true. are controlling our behavior. When you eat prebiotic, which is, back to, which is uh, fiber that you, your body doesn't digest, but bacteria in your gut do, those are good bacteria. They produce good products, and those good products actually uh, help us. So they act prevent cancer, they slow aging, they decrease inflammation, um, and they are uh, supported by the use of fiber. And so that's why it appears that fiber decreases the risk of all kinds of cancer. But the other thing that those bacteria do, those fiber-loving bacteria, mm -hmm. is that they send signals to your brain to tell you, stop, shut down the carbs, stop eating the carbs. We don't want those carbs because the neighborhood is crazy and it's overrun <laughs> by all these carbohydrate-loving bacteria. bacteria. You know, you use the word prebiotic, but we hear probiotic. Same thing or different? Not the same thing. Okay. So um, probiotic is actually taking the bacteria in, so ingesting the bacteria. Uh, when you eat yogurt, it's a probiotic. So you're eating the actual bacteria and those bacteria, usually fiber loving, good quality bacteria, they will inhabit your gut and eat whatever fiber you send to them. That's a probiotic. Mm -hmm. A prebiotic is the fiber you send to them. Okay, okay. A any, um, uh, you know, we're talking about cancer and nutrition. So we've gone all sorts of different ways in this conversation. We're not scripted. So just want to <laughs> let you know, I feel like we're getting, um, you are getting free medical advice. Dr. Mark Hunter from the Ellis Vichelle Cancer Center. This is Focus on Your Health. So this is very interesting. Um, you mentioned um, the good and the bad bacteria in the foods. You also mentioned fermentation. So I want to go back mm -hmm. to that. I have friends that uh, reach for the kombucha, which yeah, I'm not thrilled with the taste of it, but you mentioned sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. Are those the kind of fermented foods as well? That Absolutely. Uh, I love that stuff. And okay. um, it, uh, it, it's spicy, fermented, again, tastes a little like vinegar. 
Uh, cabbage is a, a nearly perfect food. I mean, from the best that we can tell, cabbage is wonderful for us in every way. So when you ferment cabbage, uh, like in sauerkraut or uh, in uh, kimchi, I think is a, mm -hmm. another name for it, um, it, 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 it seems to be good uh, across the board. I don't want to wrap up without getting more questions from our viewers. This is a joint project Focus on Your Health with MU Healthcare and KRCG-TV. If you're watching and you have questions, uh, please enter them under the comments. I'm Teresa Snow with Dr. Mark Hunter. As well, this whole conversation, we're probably about, uh, I don't know how many minutes in we are now, but um, it, 25 minutes. We have about five minutes left. Mm -hmm. We'll wrap it up, but the whole conversation uh, will be on our Facebook page, so you'll be able to see it there. So um, we have about five minutes. Uh, we want to talk about the future of cancer and nutrition. Where do you see us going? Um, what will be the conversation with you and your patients uh, 10 years from now, do you think? Uh, that's a wonderful question, Teresa. I, really what we have right now is a collection of uh, studies that begin to show us from a uh, theoretical basis why we think certain foods are good, from a uh, animal studies basis why certain foods are good, but really in cancer care uh, we're about randomized trials and so okay. we don't really begin to absolutely trust data until we have compared it in the most rigorous scientific way. Those studies are hard to do in nutrition. You can imagine that people eat what they want when they go oh, home. A lot even, of variables. A lot of variables, even when they're enrolled in a specific trial to look at that. So it is not easy to study in a randomized fashion, but we are beginning to look at that. How can we compare patients with uh, undergoing standard, state-of-the-art cancer treatment and patients undergoing standard, state-of-the-art cancer treatment with a nutritional component. And those studies are really going to require a very large budget and many, many thousands of people who do their best to try not to alter their diet from the recommended uh, uh, version. Mm -hmm. On top of that, it's about can we uh, provide these foods for people? It's not so easy to do. You mentioned pesticides and chemicals. Mm -hmm. Can we provide these very high quality foods to our cancer patients in a uh, uniform fashion, in a standardized fashion? And, and so I, I believe that 10 years from now, I will be having conversations with my patients that are really very uh, uh, well documented in randomized trials, not in animals necessarily anymore, but in people, mm -hmm. translating them uh, into into the care of people. And it's safe to say, let's study you eating more good food. That's correct. Yes. And, and really on top of that, the entire cancer picture is one where, you know, we are increasing our knowledge about cancer exponentially. So okay. every, uh, every year we, we double, triple our understanding of tumor biology, and that is translating into cures. It's going to be an, an amazingly different landscape for treating cancer 10 years from now, even five. Okay, before we wrap it up, we do have another question from Jen. Thank you. Is it worthwhile to take vitamins? Well, thanks, Jen. This is a, a very uh, interesting question. It, there is a good deal of data to support the use of vitamins. I hear a, a, a and I will preface that by saying okay. not all vitamins are equal. Uh, most uh, people eating a standard sort of American diet get a good deal of vitamins and minerals, uh, probably as much as they need. But when you look at uh, certain things like uh, fish oil supplementation or flaxseed, uh, things that have a, a, a little extra boost maybe in omega-3s, they've done studies looking at olive oil, as, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. as a form of supplementation. There are clearly uh, supplements that support uh, a, a healthy uh, uh, overall uh, life. And, and so, it, it, there, unfortunately, I have a lot of patients who come in and they say, I'm taking these vitamins, is this okay while I'm undergoing cancer treatment? It, it, may, inter it may interfere, and so it may interfere with chemotherapy, but one of the things that bothers me is when they tell me they're paying three or four hundred a month for these vitamins. I really um, am, am not in favor of that approach. And people who prey on, on, on patients uh, and their families who are suffering. We mentioned vitamins. You mentioned fiber before. Fiber supplementation? Very well? much so. Love it. Um, all fiber supplementation, uh, it, it, uh, it seems to d suppress cancer. Several different kinds of cancer, heart disease. Uh, again, by telling you what to eat, those bacteria will shut down your carbohydrate consumption and decrease the, 
um, uh, decrease your energy storage. As we wrap up this focus on your health segment, we've looked at two things in cancer and nutrition. Nutrition for people who have cancer and nutrition for people who wanna prevent cancer. So let's just wrap up those mm -hmm. two angles. People who have cancer, what should they focus on when it comes to nutrition? So again, it's a matter of whether you fall into that camp of, of having a, a uh, a little bit uh, of excess energy storage versus mm -hmm. do you have a, sort of an average amount or do are are you low are mm -hmm. you a little bit low on energy storage? He's saying that, but he means oh, oh, extra weight uh, yeah. or not enough weight. That's right. And so um, again, regardless of that, uh, calorie content coming in the form of unsaturated plant-based fats. Um, and uh, veg fruits and vegetables appear to be the highest quality uh, foods that we can eat. Uh, and if you've got extra weight, it's about, uh, it's about fasting. A again, uh, plant-based fats is a great form of, uh, of uh, nutrition for those patients, and you don't want to fast all the time, and you don't want to drop your weight uh, too fast. Uh, but really, stay away from the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are powerfully addicting. The, the brain looks at carbohydrates as morphine and it feels like morphine to our brains. And so uh, be careful of the carbohydrates. If you wanna get rid of them, get rid of them completely. And if I wanna prevent cancer, give me the grocery list. What should mm -hmm. I be buying? So if you wanna prevent cancer, it's about, again, olives, avocados, nuts, seeds. And the other thing we didn't mention is peppers and, and uh, um, herbs. So herbs and spices, they've all been tested. Almost all of them prevent cancer in, the, in, uh, in laboratories. And so spice, make your food spicy. Uh, I, we like to joke that uh, when it comes to the pepper and the pepper mill that comes to your mm -hmm. table at a restaurant, let them keep grinding until it gets <laughs> awkward and weird and they start to br uh, break a sweat. Uh, because you're, pe you're peppering your food, and if you over pepper your food, you get the benefits of the pepper mm. from a cancer standpoint, but you eat less and maybe a little bit more slowly. I never thought of that. I'm very light on the pepper. I'll have to be a little more generous. And uh, last, you know, pitch for prevention. Uh, you know, I mentioned all five of the cancers we treat mm -hmm. are preventable. Ovarian cancer can be, uh, uh, any birth control pills at any time in your life, uh, particularly five years or more, uh, reduce the risk of ovarian cancer by 50%. Uh, uterine cancer is about, uh, as I said, staying relatively thin. Don't have a bunch of energy storage because that increases the risk of okay. uterine cancer. Cervical, vaginal, vulvar cancer, all related to smoking. And so you can prevent those cancers by not smoking, but also by getting HPV vaccine. So we've got cancer vaccines now. Uh, I saw a patient today with cervical, a new diagnosis of cervical cancer, and it pains me when that, when, to see that in 2018 when we have a vaccine to prevent it. And I'm guessing as well, have a conversation with your family about your family history of cancers. Absolutely. Uh, genetics is everything these days, and so we are monitoring our patients, not just their tumors for specific genetics, but um, their genome. So mm -hmm. what were they born with? And it, I am absolutely passionate about that because if we identify one patient with a genetic defect that increases the risk of cancer, we've identified a wide family of those patients, and we can really prevent uh, cancers in the patients in whom we know have a genetic predisposition to them family history, behaviors, good nutrition. You're just filled with so much good information. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark Hunter My of the pleasure. Ellis Fischel Cancer Center. Thanks for joining us for this Focus on Your Health. You can watch the entire interview um, on the Facebook page. Have a good night, everybody.